All right, welcome to episode seven of season two of the Jumping the Rail podcast. This is Mark Redman from Champaign, Illinois. And once again, I'm joined by my buddy, my tag team partner, the Italian stallion, Gary Vassalio. Uh, Gary, how you doing, buddy? Oh, I'm I'm all alive and mostly well. Mostly well. That's <laughs> all you can hope for, really. And knowing you, that says a lot. Because yep. uh, you're always aching in some form of your, some part of your body. Yeah, we, the whole family had the COVID. If you oh. the last, so it's been recovery and being sick and everybody being sick and going to doctors, coming home from doctors. Well, I hope everybody's doing good, man. But uh, I, I went and got the booster on Friday and uh, may, may have made the mistake of getting the booster and the flu shot at the same time. Because yeah. uh, I was pretty much out of commission for the whole weekend, just recovering, and uh, yeah. not, not well, a lot of fun. The shots and the boosters always put me out for about a day, so I have to get mine on a Friday after work or something. Yeah, that's why I did mine on Friday. Funny thing is, I think I caught a cold from my wife right before then. But anyway, what's enough of the shop talk about our various medical problems. Let's talk some wrestling, Gary. So... I don't know if I, I'm guessing you didn't watch the uh, NWA pay per view over the weekend on Saturday night. No, I, I didn't even. The only, only spoiler I read was um, that Titus was the new champion. Tyrus. Tyrus. Titus. <laughs> Not Titus. Tyrus won't fit under the ring. No, he'll be <laughs> in the ring. Yeah. Yeah, that was that was the big thing. It caused a lot of uh, commotion online uh, after Tyrus beat uh, Trevor and Cardona, because a lot I, of people wanted Cardona to take it. Yeah, I just it doesn't seem like he's popular at all. Like there's usually like a there's usually like a good mix of like oh you're just hater. No, people are just like this dude is horrible. <laughs> like he's there. One guy said, why don't you just make Tim Storm champion again? He can still wrestle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He still goes like he can go. He's well into his 50s, I think. But uh, right now, I think he's like their GM on one of their TV shows. But, uh, yeah, everybody, I think, was wanting Cardona to take the title. Just, you know, names for mainstream name. And uh, also, damn good as a heel on that show. So. That was well, the, I, mean, uh, I can probably see why he wanted Ty Tyrus because he's on Fox News. He's got that's the that's it. That's the big, and that's also probably part of the reason why he's getting so much grief from fans because you know maybe they are not uh, big on the, uh, the the Fox News right wing media. Yeah. But I mean, he's going to take the, he's going to take the belt on Fox News. He's going to. He's going to talk about it. It's going to get national exposure. Yeah, and that I think that's what NWA needs more than anything. I'm sure uh -huh. I I watched it when I first came out on YouTube, and I enjoyed it because it was very old school, mm -hmm. and it, it felt very like that. But then I just kind of during the pandemic where they kind of shifted things, I I fell off, and I've never really went back. Yeah, I'm kind of the same way because when it first started, I'm with you. It brought back that old studio wrestling vibe to it. And I really thought it was awesome. They had some really good names that once the pandemic happened, they all left because NWA basically went on hiatus. They stopped running TV, like their YouTube show. So they yeah. all went to AEW or Impact. And so they kind of had to start from scratch again when the uh, lockdown lifted. And they're making the, they're making the most of it because uh, – I mean, I watched the show on Saturday. They had some really good matches on there. Davey Richards uh, defended his MLW National Openweight title against Colby Carino. It was a really fun match, which is – Colby is one of my favorite guys on that show. He's such a slimy little heel, just like his old man. But uh, You're a Carino, you're going to be a heel. That's just, oh, yeah. I, I, I think that's in the contract. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Uh, but yeah, just kind of a just a brief rundown of what happened on that show. Uh, the Fixers, uh, you know Jay Bradley, right? The the former Brad Bradley in the Indies. 
him and Bron Wrecking Ball and Gursky are the U.S. tag team champions there. And they uh, they beat the Spectaculars to retain their championship. Uh, let me see. Uh, Baby beat Colby. Uh, Homicide dropped the junior heavyweight title to Kerry Morton with his, uh, his dad, Ricky, ringside in a really fun match. The Hawks Airy, which is uh, Luke Hawks and his son, PJ, for those that don't know, uh, lost their bid against uh, La Brevillon, which is Beastia 666, and Mecha Wolf for the World Tag Team titles. Uh, Beastia is Damien's. Can you remember Damien from WCW? So yeah, Damien's. Damien, Damien had a, a good gimmick. I don't remember. It was either him or Halloween that really couldn't work very well, but they both had. I think that was Halloween. I don't know. I don't remember exactly. Yeah. But Damien was in their corner. He's been in their corner lately and uh, helping them cheat and all that. Just good stuff. And uh, there was uh, Max the Impaler, the non binary nightmare, who we talk about a lot on my other podcast, the Zero One Shootout. Uh, she won a casket match over, I forget what the girl's name is. She's Natasha something. I apologize because I don't remember her name off the top of my head. But she's got the, the Sinister Minister is her manager, uh, Max. So uh, it's, a, it's a pretty fun package. She's, Max is the one that's getting a lot of uh, attention because apparently Sarah Logan uh, has been kind of given her look in her big comeback on SmackDown. Oh, really? Uh, it's, they're very different characters, to be fair. Sarah's doing the Viking thing, you know, with, with War Machine. Yeah. But Max is more of like a Fury Road monster character, for lack of a better term. But they both wear the brown leather and had the dreadlocks and the face paint. So, yeah, it's you can, you can see where there could be a little, uh, little. Hey, wait a minute, you know. But, there's, uh, there's new, especially in wrestling. Are there any real original ideas anymore? Anyway, no. no. It's like it's like that's like a local man saying like Metallica stole a riff from them or something. It's just, <laughs> it's like, dude, I'm sure, I'm sure. They did, but I'm sure yours isn't original either. <laughs> no. The only original riff out there is Johnny B. Good. Yeah. Because <laughs> that was in 1955. Yes. So, yes. But uh, so I, I don't know if you've been hearing the news about uh, Nick Aldis, Gary. Uh, apparently, he put his notice in. He was going to work the pay per view against Odinson, but. Uh, he put his notice in, then he started taking some shots at the NWA in interviews and on social media. So Billy Horgan uh, suspended him and just sent him home. Right. So now he, so now he's just not doing anything with the company until he's a free agent or until he signs with somebody else. I This kind of goes back to our last discussion, and I kind of feel vindicated about my views on AEW being like, almost completely kayfabe now because if you look remember all the internet darlings when uh alistair black or whatever his name is now um malachi malachi black am i still on there yeah you're okay all i see is all i see is me now yeah um i got you but, I'm, I'm taking liberties with the with the uh, directing yes <laughs> <laughs> don't shoot <laughs> don't turn a work into a shoot. but so like all the internet darlings were like oh give him his release give him his release you know you, he deserves it it's this and that it's mental health it's blah 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 and then Buddy Murphy's next and he's going to leave and none of them left they were given their release they were given the freedom oh and guess what none of them left you know why because it was all work mm -hmm. I think maybe Billy Corgan's either that or Nick's for some reason just mad. And I and I could see why. Maybe he's not getting paid enough. He did carry that company, but if you if you I if you hitch yourself to NWA, you know even the most you're gonna get paid isn't what you'd get paid probably high up in NXT. Yeah. And all this has proved himself enough that he could go somewhere else. Oh, yeah. But he doesn't seem to want to, so I, there might be something there, but it could just be it could just be all kayfabe too. And so, 
I, I, I enjoy the idea of not knowing. And so I kind of like this new era that Tony has kind of started to bring around and maybe Billy now, but, and Matt Cardona. I, I mean, we didn't, yeah. I didn't give him any credit. Like Cardona, he doesn't like, he, he's on, he's on his channel and he's on Twitter all the time, but he doesn't give anything oh, yeah. away. So, I mean, props to him. He could, he could just be telling everybody, oh yeah, this is all work, you know? No, and especially when he was doing the GCW stuff, he, the, he was, he was that character. He was that yeah. character all the time. And he Chelsea, still, the same. Yeah, he still does appearances for GCW and still does the same thing. Yes. He's, he's just the action figure guy who's the asshole heel, you know? Yeah. But, but going back to Nick, I'm, it's pretty safe to assume, and I don't know salaries or anything like that, and I don't care to. It's pretty safe to say he's probably making a fraction of what he he even made an impact when he was there, when he was he, the world champion. He might make more just because, but he does he couldn't be making a whole lot more. Like, no, because man, Billy's just Billy. Like he doesn't. He talked about getting TV deals, and he said he had more people, but I haven't seen him materialize. So he's still this fan, like, out of pocket, and I don't know where he's making money. Maybe from outsourcing his talent to other shows, like when they book somebody to come in for another company. Maybe he gets a percentage of that. But with Aldis, I also know he does have a, a business outside of the wrestling. He has, a, I think he has a vitamin supplement business or something like that in Tennessee so I think that's where it is probably where most of his bread is buttered these days and uh you know they do very well for themselves him and Mickey they're they're doing fine (laughs) I'm not necessarily worried about that but But, uh, I do I do agree with you this so uh Nick Aldis I think saved the NWA in 2019 I I wasn't a big fan of his at all and over time I've, I've grown I've grown to appreciate him yeah. TNA as Magnus or whatever he was he was just he was so so yeah, he was just one of the guys. Uh but, the one that sold me on him was when he wrestled Cody at uh, all in. That's when I really appreciated his work for the first time. And then it, that moved on to doing power and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I think I think people are gonna look back at the run Cody had during that time and give it a lot more credit for what's happening now than what he gets now. For some reason, people just kind of forgot that he was, although the Bucks were all over the place, they were always all over the place. But Cody yeah. made it a point to be high profile everywhere he went mm-hmm. and elevate whatever he went to and be vocal about it. And he had a plan. And yeah. well, really, shoot, remember that list he put on uh, Twitter, like as soon as he got released, all yeah. the guys he wanted to work and everywhere he wanted to go. Yeah, I mean, him and Jericho versus Omega in Japan. I think that's the reason we're at where we're at, where you have wrestling every day of the week. And no matter what anybody wants to say about, like he made a, he made this smart decision. WWE, I'm guessing, backed up just a truck full of money. Like I would, I would imagine, it. and Vince almost seemed to bring, it. and it, it was, hey, I'm gonna get this back for death. But, but yeah, all this was, all this was their savior the entire time. So I can't imagine Corgan, unless Nick just wants the title back, and Billy's just telling him, no. and I can maybe see that. Right. But you had it, you had it for years, so kind of one of those maybe you should let somebody else run with that for a while and do something else or yeah give a chance to work with some of the uh, undercard guys kind of build them up a little bit and uh, yeah like the guy he was supposed to work with over the weekend Odinson just another guy with a like a Viking style gimmick which I don't know if it's a gimmick maybe that's just his actual like lifestyle you know but big muscled up guy looks great and uh not bad in the ring he's like big powerhouse you know but he could have really benefited from working with a guy like Aldis on on that stage. Yep. But 
it would be more of a shame to me than any of the other stuff if he if he's going out this way in TNA in not TNA NWA. But he may be, but it yeah. could all be a work just to yeah. get eyes on. But he may be hurt or something, so he needs time off, and the better way to get time off is just to write him off. Yeah, that could easily be. Yeah, it's just it's kind of uh, remains to be seen, I guess. So we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on that. It's always fun when Billy's on busted open too, because if if this is a work, he's full work mode on the interviews. He's not uh, revealing anything if it's yeah. work or shoot. So, uh, so getting away from the NWA a little bit because I mean, there's only so much we can talk about with that. Uh, Let's talk a little bit of AEW, Gary. Uh, the big uh, announcement last week, Soraya uh, said that she's cleared to uh, to come back. She's going to wrestle Britt at the pay-per-view. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I had an issue with her promo a little bit, and I was kind of vindicated because Bully Ray kind of said the same thing the next day on Busted Open. Because uh, Paige comes out, she's very emotional, naturally, you know, she's yeah, the we saw in life to come back from injury and all that. But then after she goes, spends a good five minutes putting herself over, which, you know, no harm in that, you know, saying all this, like I, I, I've recovered uh, substance abuse. I got hit by a car and wrestled on the same day, all this, all this stuff. And then she just pretty much buried Brit on the second half of that promo saying you haven't done anything, you're not, you don't know what it means to be a star. Britt Baker made that women's division in AEW. She, yeah. uh, shoot, the matches she had with Thunder Rosa, the uh, street fights, the cage matches, holding that women's title for close to a year, if not a year, I forget the exact time. And uh, there was a while when she was probably the best thing going on the show, male or female. No, I, I, yeah, I, I don't disagree with that, but I guess my, my two responses to that being devil's advocate would be one, you pride yourself in that, on that show with writing your own promos and being able to get yourself over. Mm -hmm. So you're the star women's attraction on the show as Britt Baker. Soraya comes out. I'm sure she's talked to you about it. And she starts burying you. Well, you're the star. Shoot. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. Some. Unbury yourself. Be the heel. Do whatever. Yeah. Or just sit there with your mouth shut. Yeah. Or a gape in her case. <laughs> if which, you watch that promo, she was. She was. Which I, there. I I didn't mind because Brit's been strong for so long. And most, most everybody else she's been cocky with. This is the first time we've seen her not cocky about and almost worried. And I think that's what they were going for, that she is just not sure about herself and she's starting to have a little self-doubt. And it would be nice to see some promos with her saying that or, or something like that. But I think that's what it was. They were just trying to show a, a, just a little bit of a, a chink in her armor. And I, I I think sometimes Bully Ray forgets that it's a work. <laughs> sometimes you and, wonder how much he's working on Busted Open. Yeah, but I mean, considering like how many people he's buried on the mic or in the ring, <laughs> or he'll beat half to death because. So I mean. I always, I, although he has a lot of great thoughts, I mean, from some of his opinions, I've heard it were super great. I just think this is one of those things that, what, what, what do you want out of that promo? Do, do you want it a back and forth? Do you want Brit? And if you want Brit to be strong still, I, I, I want her to look a little weak because you're so used to her just going in and winning. Make her look a little weak. And if you, that that promo made her look a little weak, but if you want to make her look strong, she's gonna to have to make herself look strong. She's not got anybody writing for her. Right. So go do that. Go be the star. Go 
go defend yourself go stand up go do your job yeah that's so. fair i uh i kind of wish that they didn't jump right to soraya versus brit on for her first match i kind of wish they would kind of build her up like i know she's a soraya's a star i mean that's not a up for debate or anything but, yeah but yeah like there's nowhere to go from here because brit's the top of the mountain right yeah we have the thing would be jade but you know she's got the uh, her own business hey, going on no way if i'm tony khan and just acquired soraya who just came back from almost dying from a neck injury just got cleared am i putting her in the ring with jade <laughs> not gonna happen she's gonna yeah. kick her face or she's going to kick her in the back like she's not supposed to. Or she's going to hit her too hard. And I'm not saying Jade's, Jade's gotten a lot better. She really but has. Just, but she is real strong and she doesn't know it sometimes. She's very green. She's very green. Yeah. No way I'm putting Soraya in the ring with her right now. Because Soraya is going to have some rust. You're going to put her in there with somebody who knows what they're doing. I would have like, come I, in with there with uh, Serena Deeb if it was me. Oh, well, yeah. Deeb would have been would have been better probably because well Dave's just fantastic in the ring. That's Plus awesome. she's she's map based and she's not gonna be, you know, doing a bunch of dumb stuff. Like right. from what I from the interview Soraya I've heard with Soraya, she's saying that she's gonna change her style. She's not gonna take any kicks to the back or the back of the neck. Not a bad idea. Yeah, but I heard, I want to get, I want to mention this, to see if you heard the same thing. I saw somebody posted, uh, I think it's one of the dirt sheets, but I'm not going to say which one. Paige says she's cleared, but no one is allowed to do anything to her that isn't in front of her. That's, that sounds like a pretty heavy spin. Well, yeah, that, when she was on Renee Young's podcast, that's where I heard her talking about it. And she was like, yeah, I'm cleared and I've been taking bumps and that's fine. But she's like, just from like basic PTSD and just the idea, like that's all it took last time was a kick to the vertebrae. Yeah. She's not going to let anybody kick me in the back. And I'm sure she's going to be more cautious, hopefully, unlike Danielson and a bunch of the yeah. neck problems. Oh, that was a conversation we had when he first came back from, uh, yeah. I mean, he got clear. Tech- first thing he does, take doing that corner drop kick and landed right on his head. Oh, yeah. But te- technically now he's taking less, but he's he's working a different style. I wish he would work more of that style where it's more mat based and not take... You don't need to take Germans all the time and you don't need to take dragon suplexes. Be the guy who, who gets out of that move. Like There's yeah. plenty of ways to do it. Just protect yourself, man. Like It's just... Be a counter it, wrestle. It, well, it's always funny because, you know, they get a surgery done. They come back. They're supposedly 100%, which you know they're never 100%. And so the whole next six months, somebody's working on that body part because everybody knows it was hurt. Uh-huh. So you, so you got to think that's really not good. <laughs> so, but she, I think she, I'm hoping she's going to take the smart route. I'm hoping she's going to change her style up a little bit. I'm hoping that just be a bump factory like she was. Yeah, and I agree with that. And if she's committed to that, I think she'll be fine. And Brit's outside of a Serena Deeb, I think Brit's probably the best person to be in the ring with. Because Brit doesn't take a lot of crazy chances or anything like that. And no. she doesn't she doesn't do a lot of the throws or anything. She's just more like a, a just a striker, you know. But she's got that a little bit of that submission base too. So, so I am, she, I'm expecting that to be a good match. I mean, she's a lot like the Nick Aldis, basically of uh, AEW. Like her and Cody were the were the people who brought them through the pandemic. Um, and Moxley. And Moxley. Unfortunately, honestly, I, I think we got a lot so many eyes on AEW was the Brody Lee memorial show because yeah. that was super emotional. It was booked where all the faces were always winning big six man, ten man matches, and it was just booked correct. And it mm-hmm. was 
they showed so much art and respect and they got a lot of a lot of eyes and it's unfortunate yeah. that that had to happen i think Brody lee would have been unless tony khan tony khan him he, he would have been a huge star yeah but, and uh and i gotta say though my one of my favorite parts of that show they played old 55 tom waits at the end of the show yeah you don't get tom waits on wrestling shows <laughs> but such a good song though Tony's for some reason not afraid to spend money on music. Yeah, I think he's smart in where he's doing it. He's not doing it for everybody. Yeah, it's not like Paul Heyman says tells people pick whatever song you want. I'm not, not going to pay the licensing. It's well, like, yeah. it's like any independent show where you go and everybody's got. Well, it's either it's probably still either Pantera or. But they just looped the intro to walk. Or, or disturbed, right? <laughs> it's, as as my buddy Josh used to say, he's like he worked a he worked an independent show one time where two guys came out to down with the sickness and they made the third guy change his music. <laughs> They're like, no, no, that's not part. part. They've already no. You got to find something. <laughs> so. I think it was the night the line was crossed show, ECW, and like three or four of the first five guys all came out to Thunder Kiss '65. There was a lot. There was a lot of white zombie back there. Yeah. Well, hell, Jericho still uses white zombie when he does the Lionheart uh, gimmick, because that's what he used in Mexico. All right, so moving on from Sarai, Gary, uh, I mentioned uh, Full Gear coming up this Saturday. We actually will not uh, be there, be watching it live. I guess uh, we're going to Zero One Saturday night in uh, Mattoon. Oh, is that this Saturday? It's this coming Saturday. And you are my ride. <laughs> what time is it? Oh, it's at the uh, doors at six, so it starts at seven. Well, I we'll have to talk about that. We, we will discuss. We'll discuss yeah. off air. But yeah, so yeah. yeah, that show's going on the same time the full year's happening Saturday night. So I have to watch the show tomorrow on the next day, which is I think the like this. I have to watch that and then go right into Survivor Series. Or wait, no, Survivor Series is next Sunday, like a week from Sunday. I can't keep track yeah. of these things sometimes. But anyway, uh, they haven't announced a whole lot. They've announced, well, a decent amount of stuff for full gear. And uh, not a bad card overall, to be honest with you, Gary. Uh, let's run through it. Uh, uh, Darby Allen and Sting taking on Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. And I'm glad Lethal and Jeff are getting the chance to team up again without having to be with Flair. Yeah. Because from what I've seen to Jerry, he can still go. Yeah, he looks mm -hmm. great. You must yeah. have found a we'll, call, we'll call it a fountain of youth. Yeah, you can call it that. <laughs> what if, whatever it is. I'm not, I'm not saying. Hey, he's, uh, he's free of the chains of pharmaceutical dependency, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All these old guys looking great. Like, it's not all diet and exercise, but... <laughs> It's positive outlook. Modern medicine is amazing. So we'll go with Miracle yeah. Modern uh, I could honestly, if I don't really care to see Sting anymore, uh, I get why he's there. You know, he, he pops the crowd and everything. But he, the thing with him and Darby has to come to an end. They got to yeah. move on. One of them needs, I think we should turn heel. It would be best for business, I think. They don't really, because he, he's not doing anything. And I don't know, Sting's. I don't know how much more Sting can do. He's already done dives and crazy stuff and worked matches that he probably shouldn't have worked and done things he shouldn't do at sixty years old. And yeah, he's proved everything he needs to prove. I don't know what else there is. I mean, he's he's wrestling a. Maybe more ancient than oh, was it? Uh, I can't think of his name. 
It's one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Muda? Muda, yeah. Yeah. So he's wrestling Muda one more time. He's doing all this. Just, man, if I were yeah, I'd be like, yeah, Muda's my last. Yeah, just have him and Muda just go out together. Just for all time's sake. But I'm not staying in. It's not my career. But, right? Yeah. He's a big boy. So, uh, my only hope in this match is that Sting does not get the fall on Lethal. That's my biggest complaint has been Sting has been pinning the young guys in these tag matches. When it, if somebody's going to win on his team, it should be Darby. Yeah. Darby should be getting the heat in this. Especially when he made uh, Hardwood tap out when they wrestled at TR. Like, come on. Yeah. All right, so we talked about Sarai and Brit, so we won't go too deep into that. Uh, Luchasaurus against Jungle Boy, uh, Jack Perry in the Steel Cage. Uh, uh, I would have liked this to have lasted longer. Ooh. Oh, sorry. Where, where'd you go? Well, my you light some, went. Somebody, somebody de- is somebody debuting in your house? Because your light's out. No, I had it plugged into my PlayStation, and then all of a sudden my PlayStation went off. Well, you, you never look better, buddy. I'm, I'm kidding. There. Apparently, yeah. PlayStation went to sleep. I didn't ah, know. I see. All right, so uh, consider your thought there on, uh, on Luchasaurus and Jungle Boy there. I, I wish it would have lasted longer. I think they probably should have had Jack be out a little longer. I wouldn't have seen more matches with Luchasaurus on his own, doing his own thing, with Christian behind him becoming more heel. And then you can have a blow-off match. But if the, Because if the cage match isn't the blow-off match, then I don't know what it is. The only thing I can in this is, let's say Christian's actually healed up. Into the cage match, Christian comes in throws off the, the sling and starts beating up Jungle Boy. Yeah, but uh, I, or Jungle Boy thinks he's going to beat a Christian and he just takes off the sling and starts using his arm, which yeah. would be a great heel move. Oh, awesome. Awesome. There's, there's, no better, there's no better heel than Christian right now, that's for sure. No. And it's unfortunate as much as it is awesome because I do love Christian, but it's unfortunate that nobody else knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's so many people to learn from, but there's, I don't know how much learning is actually going on there, but uh, yeah, neither here nor there. No, that's a complete, I, I could fill three hours <laughs> with people learning from their elders or not, and which is not happening anymore, so. And it's ridiculous. Like, that's what you're there for. You don't, there's no other occupation on the planet where somebody can say, Well, I'm just going to figure out how to do this myself. It'll be just as, it'll be work just as well. Like, you can't walk into a factory and then tell the old guy that ran the line for 30 years that you're not going to do it his way because it's not going to work. <laughs> They're going to run you out of that place. You're yeah. not going to walk onto a football team. And say, I'm not going to learn these old plays. I want these new ones. That's, that's or tell the the guy who's been on the line longer that you're you're just that's my spot now. <laughs> well, you know how to line up. I know how to line up the way I like to line up. <laughs> I'm not gonna... You're two yards off sides. Shut up. This is how I do it. This is how I do it. Yeah. <laughs> All these under guys that are like, well, this is the new style, old man. Well, this new style is going to give you about a 15-year career. I've made dozens of dollars doing this style on the independence. Yes, make make money while you can because you won't have a career past yeah. like 10 years. Ho- hopefully you like hot dogs and a soda. Mm-hmm. <laughs> because that's all you get after that. Yeah, and if anybody makes me think in this situation it's Darby Allen just because he, I'm just... That kid scares me to death every time he goes out there because I think he's going to do something stupid one of these days and really regret it. But oh, hopefully that doesn't happen. Yeah. I want to put that out in the universe. This is bad luck. Yeah, uh, anyway. Uh, yeah, anyway. 
the uh, winter tournament final will be at full gear. Uh, they don't have the participants lined up for the final match yet. It's going to be the winner of the match between Ethan Page and Bandito against the winner of the match between Brian Cage and whoever wins the Lance Archer Ricky Starks match. So, still it's a lot of stuff to iron out. I think we'll have we'll pretty much know what's going on by Friday after Rampage is over. I hope Ethan Page takes the whole tournament. Just I'm he's so good. Be- it's going to be Cage versus somebody, I'm guessing. Yeah, Cage is wrestling the winner of Archer and Ricky Starks. And then the and winner of that match takes on the winner of Ethan and Bandito. If, if history repeats itself, which it usually does, um, Archer will somehow lose to Ricky Starks. And then Ricky Starks will fight valiantly. And then some, even though Brian Cage is literally like seven times his size and muscle mass. Yeah. <laughs> It'll, it'll be thing. And then he'll have to cheat. And then it'll be Cage versus hopefully at Ethan Page. But I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. what? MJF versus Mox, right? Yeah, main event is uh, Mox and MJF for the title. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. We got a few more to get to here. That's at the top of the list here in the main event. But uh, yeah, so a lot of. Uh, loose ends on that tournament to, before we can really get into who's going to win it. Uh, TBS championship, Jade Cargill versus Nyla Rose. Uh, I like the matchup just because for as green and physical as Jade is, Nyla can take the beating and probably dish it back out and maybe try to <laughs> so maybe get her to slow down a little bit. <laughs> slow down. Uh, Andre 101. <laughs> It just it does kind of remind me of the Brock versus uh, Strowman match, where Strowman gets with that big knee and then uh-huh. so everybody needs it as well. Just that sock in the face, just to tell you to stop. I because Jaden when she first got there, I know her and uh, Red Velvet got into it because like Jade just punched her in the face. And she didn't understand, like, why she was upset. She's like, well, she, we're, we're going to get hit. This isn't ballet. It's like, yeah, but you're you're not supposed to try to hurt her. She's your dance partner, not your right. opponent. This, this isn't real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're going to get hit in the face. That doesn't mean you have to punch them in the face. It's... Uh, I can't remember who said it, but it was it used to be, like, everybody... Everybody looked like they were getting hit in the face as hard as they could, and you barely felt it. And now it's like they're not hitting it at all, but they're just punching you dead in the face. Like, yeah, I think that that's how Bruce Pritchard said that. Yeah, I think I, I don't heard know. Pritchard say that, but yeah, but I, I've never heard it. Used to be the point to not hit somebody, and now then all these kids watched New Japan and All Japan when they were teenagers, and like, oh, strong style. Yeah. yeah, it's good for a niche, but you can't, like, if you're working that many days out of the year, you're going to hurt somebody or you're going to get hurt. You, you can't keep that up. No. So, uh, if I had to predict, I'm saying, I think Jade's probably going to take that match and get her, get her belt back from uh, Nyla, but... Uh, I don't see it being a uh, a Matt Classic, you know. For <laughs> to be honest, uh, let's move over here. The Ring of Honor World Championship Fatal Four Way: Jericho is defending against Claudio Danielson and Sammy Guevara. Uh, this could be an overbooked fiasco with all the Blackpool Combat Club guys, all the uh, Jericho Appreciation Society guys out and about. I- well, <laughs> now, now the curtain fall. Uh, now we can see what's going on behind the curtain at House Facilio. Yeah, no, I didn't know why. Yeah, there's a there's a refrigerator back there, but yeah, um, it's either going to be super good or off because it'll be too many flippy doos, 
or not a, or or just a right amount. Sammy will do some big spot, mm-hmm. and Danielson will probably do something he's not supposed to. And Jericho will do something. He'll pull something out of the bag of tricks, and Claudio will swing. Maybe Claudio will swing two people. I don't know. Okay. Uh, I want to predict the fireman's carry big swing combo. Four ways. Four ways always have a tendency to become a cluster. You always have yeah. to figure out for some reason why two guys are constantly not in the ring. <laughs> like, oh, well, this guy got powdered like some minutes ago. <laughs> 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 But when he comes back in the ring and takes three moves in a row, he's going to get fired up. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, powdering somebody is a way to win a match. I guess so. But uh, I don't... Four. What's that? But only in four ways. Only in four ways. That's right. Uh, um, my prediction, I think Jericho takes it. I think there's more money to be made with him as a Ring of Honor champion right now. Oh yeah. So uh, yeah, but I, I think it'll be I think it'll be a fun match. Uh, AEW World Tag Team Championship, the acclaimed against uh, Keith Lee and Swerve. I think this is finally the match where uh, Lee and Swerve split up. It's the they've been teasing it for weeks. Yeah. And, uh, it's either going to be a split or Keith Lee's turning heel. Ooh. Could be, just out of the no, nowhere, because he's he's been he's been vocal about not liking it, but he hasn't stopped Done working anything. with. It. No, so, he just kind of gives him the side eye every time he does it. It's like, oh, yeah. you rascal! But if they get the titles back by him turning heel, then they'll have money the talks. <laughs> but but I don't the, see them taking the belts off the acclaimed anytime soon, though. So over, I don't know why you would strip them of the titles because no. you can't. I don't want to see Swerve and Lee get them back just for a few weeks or just for one pay per view, or yeah, and then have the acclaim chasing again. They they chased their entire career in AEW, so just I would I would have them win. I don't know what you do with them versus FTR. I think that's got to be next. Yeah, FTR has been been basically waiting very patiently for their shot, but uh, and even though I, I'm not a big uh, supporter of public scissoring, I do think the Acclaimed have been doing a, a fine job. As yeah, the uh, tag champs. Yeah, I just don't know crowd wise where you're going to go with that because they're both over like mm-hmm. huge over right now. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's uh, it's just one of those wait and see things, I guess. I mean, FTR they've also been doing the thing; they've been going to Japan, defending over there, defending in Mexico. So, I mean, they got plenty of stuff to do in the meantime. So, yeah, they could just as easily uh, just kind of keep them in the wings and bring somebody else up. The guns, I guess, maybe have a shot coming up. Uh, any number of teams, three point oh, you know, but uh, it's one of those. Uh, the uh, well, the tag team division in AEW is better now than it was a year ago, but they still have a little bit to do. They're still they don't have a lot of like top five like, contenders ready to go yet. No, anytime you have to throw a team together with just two dudes, you know you're. But man, tag team divisions have just been kind of sparse for decades now. For a while, yeah. <laughs> Even when you look back at what people consider like the heyday back in like the Attitude Era, it was the Hardys, the Dudleys, and Edge and Christian. Yeah, that was the, it. The AP, and the APA was right underneath that. Yeah, and like too cool. Right. But they were, ne- <laughs> they were really never contenders. The only people that were ever contenders. So there was like six tag teams, maybe. Right. Every once in a while, the APA would get the belts, but most of the time they just came in and beat people up. Right. So. Well, I'll tell you who I wish would have gotten a real shot with uh, a, a top spot was TNA, uh, Test and Albert. Yeah. Like when they sure. had Trish. I thought they were they were way better than a lot of people give them credit for. Because I kind of I kind of binged some 2000 WWF a few weeks ago, 
So I saw a lot of TNA in that uh, few days, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, really, 2000 WWE, you'll do that. Yeah. Uh, I'll have to. <laughs> but I digress. Let's move on. Uh, AEW Interim Women's World Championship, Tony Storm versus Jamie Hayter. I always say this. I hope that Tony drops the title because putting an interim on the title is just makes it so predictable that whoever has it is going to hold it until the champion comes back, in this case, Thunder Rosa. But I want to see that title get uh, shuffled around, especially with this women's division, because outside of Britt and uh, when she's healthy, Thunder Rosa and I guess now Soraya, there's nobody really in that world title picture that is un- untouchable, you know? Yeah. So that's well, no, it, it could be a hot potato. They didn't do anything with Ruby when she first came in. She could have been top of the card. Yeah. They didn't do with, um, Athena when she first came in. They kind of gave her a little bit of. Now she's not doing anything. Now she's just shooting on young young girls and playing them too rough, getting getting a little heat. Yeah. I mean, they, they both can get promos. They both know their character. They both know how to work. And, of course, you put them in division where you need people like that, and instead of elevating them, you just kind of stick them in nowhere. Right. So, Now, with Tony and Jamie, I do like that there is a, there is a backstory there. I guess they were besties back in the U.K. So that makes for a good story, but I don't think they've explored that enough. Like, in no, storytelling sure. sense. <laughs> Haven't really said anything about it. I think it was I mean, one passing comment by Tony in an interview. I, if there's one story that's going on that I, I, I think that um, I think Thunder Rosa is hurt. That you, there's been a lot of stuff she has done in other mm-hmm. promotions. And just in her career, that kind of makes me think she's not the easiest person to, to work with. And I, I know a lot of people gave uh, Marina Shafir a lot of crap about the match she had with Thunder Rosa. Mm-hmm. Marina's green, and mm-hmm. Thunder Rosa's supposedly not. She should have let her through that match. And, the, and even all the bad-looking stuff should have looked better. Like that's your job as a veteran to yeah. and this folks you're the best in the world at what you're doing. You want everybody to believe that you're you're the best. Everybody needs to look incredible in the ring with you. That's mm-hmm. your work. And it, that's not just some dude that wrestled for a short time in his twenties saying that's any professional wrestler who's had a title would say, mm-hmm. you know, when I finally learned that making these young guys look good made me look good. You know, Shawn Michaels, before he got hurt, I, I thought he was okay. He mm-hmm. came back, started giving people, you know, giving people offense, giving people shine. He was not he was probably, in my opinion, maybe the best all-around wrestler to ever do it. Oh, yeah. He changed his mindset. And I, I think there are some people right now who have this mindset that they don't have to play play nice with anybody so i'm i'm not sure where she's going to be when she comes back i don't know who they want to beat her or if they want her to get beat but i wouldn't care if um jamie Hayter got it then you could have like a you could have finally have the breakup angle with her and Britt. Because yeah. Britt wants the title, and Britt would probably just tell her, "Give me the title." Yeah, I, I will yeah. say this: I would say a hard pass on putting Thunder Rosa with Soraya when yeah. Thunder comes back. A little absolutely, too a little stitchy, but uh... yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> nope. I get. Ooh. I'm Tony. I'm way too much invested, just in uh, case. Well, it's, I'm not so sure, like, once Soraya really gets her, her, because she's not, like, a delicate snowflake. 
And I know Thunder Rosa has done some MMA and stuff, but Soraya has been fighting with men her entire life. Since she like, was like 12. Like legitimately? So that could get bad real quick. I think there would be somebody punched dead in the mouth. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, I'm sure there's a little sucker hooligan in Soraya that's waiting so, to come out. So now that I've said that, I do want to see that match. <laughs> <laughs> in due time. I, I want to see Soraya get uh, shake off the ring rust first. Oh, it's going to, I think it'll be a while. But... Took Bunk yeah, a while. But to that's, there's long term storytelling there then. So. Yeah. What a novel idea. Yeah. All right. So uh, let's get into the main event. Gary uh, Moxley defending against MJF. Everybody's pretty much predicting that MJF's going to win the title on Saturday. I kind of hope that Moxley keeps it just to kind of expect the unexpected kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, because I want to see it's, it. I either want to see this sudden change of heart he's had be a complete work and him go just even more monster heel, like have the firm come out and him act like he's trying to stop him, mm-hmm. but they just come out and just destroy Moxley, destroy the combat club that comes out to save him. And then like he just pins him, like old school Jericho pins him. Like say Horse, horseman I, style. Yeah, just I would, you know, then you could cut the promo where, like, yeah, I, I told you I was a devil, and you tried to tell me I wasn't. Well, who's the devil now? Right. You know, I was knew you guys were stupid, and you just proved it. And, like, I'm but the, the other way you can go is, yeah, he loses, and you you try to turn him as much face as you can because everybody's cheering for him now anyway, and he's kind of doing the halfway heel, halfway face thing. And you could still have him be a cocky face. Oh, yeah. But the, I, I don't know how well that works for how long. Because that's a kind of a tenuous line to walk. It's easier to be one or the other. Yeah. Either or Stone Cold Deal. Right. Not everybody can be Tracy Smothers. That's probably fortunate. <laughs> well, and I love Tracy, but you know, it's a it's like you said, it's a slippery slope. And not everybody yeah. can afford those golden helicopters. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's still a little hot at uh, Archer for stealing those to catch rays. Well, that was the thing with Flair. Like Flair was there were times in his career, even early on, that he wasn't really a heel, he wasn't really a face, he was just kind of there. He was just flair. It was just flair. And I was like, it was okay. But it wasn't as good as when he was, you know, a, a total heel or a total fix. It just yeah, and I agree with that. Hey, uh, speaking of Ric Flair, today was, uh, I think, a special anniversary, Gary. 33 years ago today was the I Quit match between uh, Ric Flair and Terry Funk at the Clash of the Champions. And you know me, I, I love me some Terry Funk. And uh, him with Gary Hart was just a match made in heaven for me. Funker, man. he. How many retirement <laughs> matches did he end up having? Probably more retirement matches than regular matches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still, my, uh, my friend Jim Desmond does a great, he used to do a great Funk impression. But all it was was a complete, it was like a complete reenactment. If we were someplace where he could take off his shoes, it was the funk uh, forever in Japan. You know that one where he's taking off his boots and throwing them and he takes off his socks and throws them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Japan forever, forever. And that Jim does tiger. And then he'll just start forevering like this clock forever. I think Rocky Romero borrowed that. He does his forever lariats. Like in the like he has two guys in the opposite corners 
as he goes back, you know, forever, and then it's clothes lines back and forth, pounds like repeatedly. Yeah. So everybody loves Funk, man. He's so good. I, yeah. went, I went down a 97 ECW rabbit hole, found the match with uh, him and Shane and Sabu from Hardcore Heaven 97 when Douglas won the world title back. And uh, in the middle of the match, Francine interferes, you know, because, you know, it's Francine, that's what she does. And then uh, Dory came out from the back and chased her away, but not before hitting about three good the old European uppercuts on the franchise. <laughs> <laughs> Dory moved like an old man when he was like 30. Yes. He's he's one of those guys like double like JJ Dillon. He looks he looked like he was 60 in his like mid 30s. But the crazy thing with Dory is like he didn't move any different when he was like 70. He no. he's still moved. He's super moved like that. <laughs> I my favorite funk matches are Terry when he was kind of wild haired youngish and he was tagging with dory in japan and they would work like the older japanese guys at the time uh-huh. and terry would bump like an absolute mania he was getting thrown out of the ring or like kind of yeah <laughs> and he would just fly out of the ring and he would take these huge bumps in the corners and he would bump and then he would go tag dory in Dory would get in slow, go get some uppercuts, act like he was going to do the spinning toe hold. Uh-huh. <laughs> Crowd pops, gets it on there once, but can't get that second spin around. Mm-mm. I don't know how he got crowds to pop for a spinning toe hold, but that move was over. <laughs> yeah. Especially when Terry did it in ECW, he'd still get a pop for it in the late 90s. <laughs> it's you like the about... in for you to get out of. <laughs> yeah, just, just kick. <laughs> you pull your foot away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have the time. <laughs> they have to spin, and when they spin, they're barely holding on to your slippery right. boot. You have a you have a free leg to kick the guy off. <laughs> you have <laughs> stuff. You can kick him with your other leg. You can pull that foot away. <laughs> There's a plethora of options. You can use the foot to trip him. <laughs> it's, it's, the possibilities are endless there. And you you're, talking about, you're talking you about you're talking about in Japan. Uh, the most of the ones I've seen of is him and Dory against like the Briscoe brothers over there when they wrestled uh, Brody and Hanson, and uh, and you know those four guys just beating the shit out of each other. <laughs> Part of the reason some of these guys have shortened careers if they watch old wrestling. Just well, Hanson's career lasted quite a while, but yeah, like even he, never, he, he got, didn't see any of it. No, he never saw his own matches. <laughs> <laughs> Not because he didn't want. <laughs> just he physically he, couldn't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's. There is nobody I love watching more than Stan Hansen, probably. But yeah. it's just, it's just, he just doesn't care. No, absolutely doesn't care. It's like you yeah. want to rest? No, no. <laughs> this there's nothing restful about a Stan Hansen wrestle. Not a thing. You want some working punches? Not gonna get them. <laughs> You're no. not, not, not gonna get them. <laughs> you. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to hit you with a Larry. Okay, uh, just take it easy on me. <laughs> Not going to happen. <laughs> no. The, the scariest thing is the guy goes in, he can't see two feet in front of his face, and he's throwing these wild lariats. Adam Page got knocked out by a lariat from Amber or Moxley a few weeks ago. If that was Hanson, he would have killed it. Oh, that would have been good. <laughs> well, if you would have tried to sell a Hanson lariat the way Page was trying to sell the King Kong lariat, he would have died because Hanson would have been upset by that. He would have picked him up and done it again. You would just pick him up and done it again. <laughs> and it would have it would have killed him. Yeah. That, I a... he was saying, like, well, that's just, you know, I was like, no, that was a guy trying to oversell the Lariat. You just take that. You take a big bump with it. But he was trying to do a flippy do sell. 
and he didn't get his head turned all the way. Mm-hmm. And he got hit. It sucks. But that wasn't Moxley's fault. It's just uh, they kind of got crossed up. It's like a catcher going trying to catch a fastball but getting the curveball instead. Yeah. It looked real. It's always funny. <laughs> It's always funny when the umpire gets, when the catcher gets crossed up and then the umpire gets hit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Noel Ryan fastballs and catcher thinks it's yep. going to be a changeup. The umpire gets one right in the face mask. You know, so I, if MJF wins, he's turning mega heel. If he loses, he's going to become a face. I So, I mean, we'll know Sunday so, or yeah. Saturday. Well, you'll know Saturday. Well, the people will know Saturday. I'll know Sunday. Yeah. But uh, I digress. I think it'll be a fun show. It, it'll probably be a long show because that's kind of what Tony does with his pay per views. They usually go right around that five hour mark. But uh, when you're old like us, though, it's kind of a pain, especially trying to watch it live. And you have to be yeah. up for work at five in the morning. Not so good. Yeah. But, uh, Anyway, so, so yeah, that's one thing to look forward to is the, uh, it's a, it's going to be a good weekend of wrestling, but I'm going to, and this is where I'm getting better at my segues, Gary. Let's talk about a bad weekend of wrestling in 1997 oh, for, look uh, for Canadians on the whole, because our luck on this show, Gary, is whenever something really juicy has an anniversary, it's usually the off week from when we do the show. So yeah. we always, we're, all, we're always a little tardy talking about it, and this is no different. Last week on Wednesday was the 25th anniversary of the Montreal Screw Job, which, if you have, if you've been living under a rock the last quarter century, is when uh, Vince McMahon rang the bell on Bret Hart during his world title defense against Shawn Michaels at the Survivor Series. Bret threw a hissy fit with WCW. And then his career went down the toilet. Is that a yeah. fair uh, assessment? Pretty close. Um, there was my take originally was I was a huge Bret Hart Mark, so I hated Shawn Michaels mm-hmm. and hated Vince McMahon. Blah blah blah. After I watched Wrestling in Shadows, I still thought Vince was garbage. Oh, I still. Yeah. Think he's not the best guy to ever live by any means. Don't get me wrong, because <laughs> he's wait, he's a carny. <laughs> wait, has, has something happened to put him in a bad light? No I'm kidding. <laughs> It'd be easier to count the things that happened to put him in a good light, probably, with, especially within the last decade. <laughs> the SFL <laughs> not being one of them. Yeah. Well, he sold. It. <laughs> yeah. It sell it the second yeah. time. But there was an aspect of Brett screwing Brett, but there was an aspect of Vince screwing Brett because from what I have uncovered with interviews and people talking, Brett was getting increasingly hard to work with. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was more and more full of himself, which a lot of guys happened to him in those days because they were fighting, still fighting for he spots. Was, yeah, he was, he was the top guy. He was starting to say that. Yeah, I mean, you had Austin coming up, and you've had Michaels always sniffing around, so he was right. fighting for that. And this this was also the era where they thought it was a good idea to give people uh, creative control. Uh-huh. And, it, and so Hogan used that all the time in WCW, and that's what happened to WCW. Yeah, Hogan, talk- used, Hogan used it like a jazz musician uses a trumpet. Yeah, you can talk on one about how big like the only thing he did was he gave Hogan creative control and Hogan never knew when to drop the belt like no. he never knew when it was his time he always thought if you, you could get better ratings with him as champion all you needed was him on television and it would have been just as fine like Savage with the title would have been great for a while and something new even Kevin Nash with the title once he beat Goldberg at least yeah. that would have been different, but then you just always giving it back to Hogan. Yep. And Hogan wasn't 
the best worker of all time to begin with. But then you bring what? Well, yeah. I'm going to go ahead and stick with that. <laughs> because I'm not wrong. I'm wrong. Davidus is furious right now. He, I know that I know the the, the prop popular thing to say is, well, in Japan he was pretty good. Well, in Japan he wasn't horrible. I mean, yeah. But Hogan was very much the face of work smarter, not harder, in the wrestling but, business. But that's part of my whole thing with like looking at the whole situation with Brett. He had the the offer from WCW. But he knew what WCW was. So if you're going to stay in WWF and you know, because Vince has told you, I can't afford to pay you Mm -hmm. this amount of money. And you, so I mean, you still go to WCW because of the money. And then you expect them for some reason to be magnanimous with the title and so it it's like slapping a snake on the head and then like picking it up and it not biting you that's just love right (laughs) that's that's not you know that's not him being nice it's just you're you have dumb luck like vince was of course it's gonna bite and michaels because michaels was michaels at the time like if it were sean now no that wouldn't have happened if yes. Shawn Michaels wins, yes, it's going to happen. Like Brett played himself into that position. Mm-hmm. If he, if he would have been a professional, I don't care where you were in the world. He should have been a professional when his boss said you're dropping the title tonight because you're leaving mm-hmm. in a day. I'll right. let you say goodbye to everybody tomorrow, but you have to drop the title tonight. And if Brett would have been professional about it and said, okay, because it does, Mark, I'm going to put and give you a little secret. Professional wrestling is predetermined. <laughs> now, wait, we can't have those kind of hot takes on this show, Gary. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's pushing your luck a little bit. So, so <laughs> he worked himself into a shoot, is yeah. what he did. And he got too big for his britches, not. See, on the other side of that, not saying what Vince did was right, because it right. wasn't. Out of the boys, like Mick Foley walked out, Undertaker threatened to walk out. There Undertaker, were a lot. Threatened to ki- Undertaker threatened to kill Bruce Prichard. Yeah. I don't know yeah. if you heard the story. Uh, Taker wasn't wrestling that night, but he was sitting in Gorilla with Prichard the whole time, just watching the show. And right before the main event, I, and I just watched this main event yesterday, they had the long shot of both of them walking from the back to the ring, like backstage. So yeah. before they did that, Bruce told Taker to go hide out in like Vince's office or dressing room so he didn't get shown in Gorilla. So Taker left. And then what happens, happens. And as they're walking back, Taker's waiting on Bruce because Taker thought that Bruce knew something and was just trying to keep Taker away because yeah. you know Taker would have been out there. Yeah. If he knew something was going to happen. Because Taker was still the policeman of the locker room back then in 97. Yeah, I, I know Mick actually quit. He was gone for a yeah. few days. And he missed because, like a week. Yeah. And uh, there were a, with Rube, few... he, Yeah, Rube left because of it. Yeah. That's when he, he did the uh, two shots on the same night. So it was. Uh... There was a lot of dumb on both sides, but yeah. there was a lot of just ego, and that's what it was. That's what it ended up being. Like Brett should have been the professional because Brett was a professional. Vince, that's Vince's. That was Vince's baby. That's his ball, and he yeah. he can take that ball anytime he wants and go home with it. That's. That's the thing that's always been in WWF. And if Brett wanted to change that, he should have bought the company. Yeah. So as much as I love Bret Hart, still love him to this day, he's, he's not on high as on my list as he used to be. No. But I think he's amazing. 
he should have just said, you know what? Yeah, I don't. And I, you know, he could have said, I don't like Shawn Michaels. Never have, never will. He could have said it to his face, said, Shawn, I don't like you. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. <laughs> but he should have still dropped the belt to him. Yeah. And yeah. just a professional thing, came out the next night, said goodbye to everybody, and went out on his back in the country. Right. Or hell, they was on the... Well, no, I can't really do that. Because I heard another story that he was going to... They were going to do the schmaz with Michaels and Survivor Series, and the next night he was going to drop it to Shamrock. I don't know how true that is. But I'm going to yeah. play devil's advocate here for a second, Gary, with, uh, for, on Vince's uh, end of it. That Survivor Series was right around two years after Medusa dropped the title in the trash can on Nitro. So you know he was still snake bit about that. And that was probably a pretty driving factor into why he wanted to get that belt off of bread at Survivor Series. Because yeah. he does like as much as he knows, as well as he knows Brett, who's to say Bischoff wasn't going to offer him a half million dollars to drop the belt in the trash can on Nitro? Yeah, I mean, that's understandable. And then the Outsiders had already left, right? Yeah, the Outsiders were gone. Uh, Waltman was gone. I think Jarrett had just come back from WCW. But uh, yeah, it was still kind of that influx of guys moving, like uh, Crush hadn't left yet, but uh, yeah, it was, they were still, it was right in the middle of that time when they were really log jamming the NWO with everybody. Basically, anybody that got released or left WWF went and joined the NWO. And uh, and that's what happened to Brett. He did the same thing. NWO had more valets than some factions have members. <laughs> yeah. Rude, Virgil, uh, Elizabeth. The Disciple. The Disciple. Oh, Beefcake. Poor Beefcake. <laughs> I remember one time Hogan told him to use his finish, and it was like a stunner. They gave yeah. Beef the stunner. Nobody else could do Well, Disco could do the stunner. but He did the chart think, buster. Yeah, I think Disco will even change the chart buster for a while because... Yeah, I think he made it in a mech breaker for a while. Yeah, but they... But they never did anything with with Brutus, and he just he came in. I didn't even know it was him because he had the big beard. He completely changed his look. It took me a few weeks to figure it out. Yeah, I was like, I see him. He was the booty man. That's beefcake. <laughs> <laughs> but then it just makes so much sense that it'd be beefcake for Hogan to have a lackey. It's got to be beefcake. No, yeah, I I understand the idea that I I completely understand Vince being gun shy at at very best about saying hey yeah you know what brett you're the champ you have creative control and but i mean it's that was a slippery slope too because then any wrestler that from that point on that was like well i want creative control in my contract was just gonna know that you're lying yeah and if you really wanted something bad enough you were just going to do it to them so, I mean, that's taking trust away. But when you look at it, creative control went out the window shortly after that. You never heard of people creative control no. anymore. Vince was like, no, and I can't do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. That's, the closest thing was Hunter, but he was on the creative team pretty much. Yeah. But uh, well, even Stone Cold didn't have complete control over his character. I mean, that's why he yeah. took his went home. Like, yeah, he, he tried to pull a little bit of that and said, yeah, hey, I'm not working with this guy. And he said it wasn't because he didn't want to work with Lesnar. He wanted to do it on a pay-per-view. He wanted to make some money on, on the match instead of an unadvertised TV match. No, I, 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 I understand Stone Cold's stance on it more. Plus, when you like watch him talk about it, like he was beat up. Like his, he, everything hurt. Like, he had been just working, 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 working for months and months. It's like the dude was just done for that time. And yeah. if he wouldn't have taken that time off, his body would have forced him. To he, he would he would not have made it to WrestleMania 19 if he no. hadn't taken the time off. 
Vince, but, uh, no, I agree with your assessment of, of Vince. Like, like I said, when I was younger, I was all Bret Hart, all the way, screw Shawn Michaels for what he did. I hated Sean after seven. I hated Gorilla Monsoon because he restarted the 60 minute Iron Man match. That should have been a draw. Because it screwed Brett. It should have been a draw. Yeah. It should have been, was that a dusty finish? <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. But uh, another thing to think about everybody always, it's when people tell the story nowadays, it's a three headed monster. It's Brett, it's Sean, it's Vince. And as it goes, the story is Vince told Sean. Apparently, apparently Sean knew about it, but no, there's no Vince way he told Vince told him to deny, deny, deny. He Vince told him he would take all the heat, and Sean just he didn't want Sean to say anything because he didn't want him to get more heat from the rest of the boys than what he already had in general because of his personality. But uh, <laughs> so but, or at the time lack thereof. Yeah, but in <laughs> Sean's defense, though, if your boss tells you to do something. Then you're gonna do it. Same thing with Little Hedner. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I, at the time I blamed him, but Sean did what Brett should have done because his boss do something. Yeah. Listen to it, boss. And it, don't get me wrong, because there's been plenty of things my bosses have told me that I've said no because that was dumb or dangerous. But when you're wrestling, like, and especially then. Somebody else would be low. Vince would have said, "Hey, I need you to to actually pin Brett. We're actually we're we're gonna do Brett in this match." Yeah, you can say no to that. Like Bruce Pritchard telling you, then you go to Vince. Yeah. So Vince is like, "Yeah, this is what's happening." It's like this happening whether you like it or not. It's like no crap. So, it, are you gonna go to WCW when he fires you? <laughs> is that your best hope? And then hope that right. they don't shut down. Because he'll never hire you again. Like Vince would, if Sean would have would have refused, he would have found either found somebody else to do it, or he would have figured something else out, and he would have never. Sean would have never done anything. Yeah, and it's easy to say Sean had a welcome invitation to the New World Order waiting for him at WCW, considering that all of his buddies were already there. But it's like you said, who's to say that that company's not going to... Well, that company's going to last three more years, pretty much. Yeah. Before it just shit the bed. So, they made all, so, all those guys made enough money or should have made, but they didn't apparently have enough money to survive the rest of their life. But apparently some people don't know how to save millions of dollars. Then you got your Scott Steiners who buy a Shoney's franchise in Georgia and, you know, they do it does fine for himself, you know. Well, I mean, he's probably the accountant, right? What's that? Probably the accountant, right? He is amazing at math. <laughs> this is true. He didn't, he, he's, they gave the wrong Steiner the teaching job than the, the school board. I st still watch that. Oh, it's oh. so good. I remember watching that like when it first happened, and I'm just I was watching with my brother, and we were just looking at it and we're like we're just looking at each other dumbstruck, like what did he say? He's like, 30, wait, you know. and I'm just gonna, I'm getting a calculator and I'm trying to do the math and my like wait no this isn't right, yeah. but just classic. It's almost as good as the Sid Vicious. I'm twice as big as you, but I have half the brain or whatever it was that he said. To, wasn't wasn't inaccurate. No, it wasn't. But I don't think that's what he was trying to say. No, but it was strangely apropos. <laughs> oh, Sid, we could we could we could do a whole show on Sid. Yeah, but we gotta make sure it's not softball season before we do it. <laughs> hey, you know what? One of my favorite Shawn Michaels matches for a long time was. Him versus Sid, where uh, was it? John, the cameraman. Oh, uh, uh, the one where Sid hit him with the hit Jose with the camera. Yeah, yeah, that was Survivor Series '96. I just watched it yesterday. It's a good match. That's a great match. It just goes to show Sean can get a good match out of anybody. Yeah. 
And uh, yeah, Sid was not uh, Frank Gotch by any means, but when he just sticks with what he's good at, you know, big boot, choke slam, clothesline, power bomb, you're good. Just you no beat like- frogs, no big boots off the top rope. If no. if his match if his matches with Spike Dudley taught us anything, he's not even good at bombs. Like, don't <laughs> either because he about killed Spike. I don't know how many times because Spike weighed like nineteen pounds. Yeah, so correct. Accurately, <laughs> he was. He was. I think one fifty was being generous when yes. they announced his weight. He was probably close to one thirty five. With with weights in his pocket. Like, yes, and Sid still couldn't just get him through a tech. No. It was pretty impressive. Yeah. That makes it that much more fun to watch when Spike wrestled Mike Awesome later. Yeah, it was awesome. Was athlete named he, he would when he would just carry Spike up the touch of the top rope on his shoulders. Yeah, like, good lord! I mean, if it wasn't for his stunning lack of loyalty then Awesome could have been one of the biggest stars ever in ECW. Yeah. But again, uh, again, Money Talks, kind of going back to the Brett thing, you know, they backed up a armored truck to Mike Awesome's front door and said, hey, I don't care if you're ECW champion, come to WCW and drive a tie-dyed bus and please the fat ladies yeah. and, uh, and you'll make a lot of money. Yeah, but he had a lot of head trauma too, so it wasn't. Yeah, he did. I mean, worked with Masato Tanaka for ten years. It's gonna happen. I don't know how Tanaka's still alive, but oh my god, I think he's. I don't know for sure, but I think he's kind of lightened up on the chairs lately. One, one would hope. <laughs> yeah, it might be a condition. It's like he can't get health insurance unless he gets up to the steel chairs. <laughs> I. I think we pretty much decided what our position on the screw job is, but I had one. There was a, there was something this week I wanted to talk to you about and just get your take. I don't know if you saw it. It was the, I think it was four or five. Was it six women? It was four like number one contendership that I, I don't remember one. The one on SmackDown? Yeah, Liv Morgan and Raquel Rodriguez. Yeah, Lacey, Zayali, Shotzi, and somebody else. Uh, Sonia. But so there's that spot where uh, Raquel has um, can't think of her name. What time number? Zayali? No. Uh, I gotta go back been, and watch the match. She's been with um, Liv. Okay. She was the general manager. Oh, Sonia. Yeah, I like the bill. She's Sonya the bill. Sonia's great, but yeah. Raquel Sonia up, and she was up on stairs, and there was a table behind her, and then Liv jumps from the barricade and hits this body, and as they fall. He completely missed the table. Liv's forehead comes like this far from just hitting the table. Raquel's mm-hmm. neck will almost just crack through the t- There was all two almost deaths from that spot. Yeah. But Raquel was strong enough to basically dump Sonya off, who landed bad. Right. I guess what, what I'm getting at is so they're giving them more time to wrestle. And they're giving a more extreme thing, and and a I'm going to blanket AEW with this too. So you you're you're giving your guys more time to wrestle, which is great. But if they're using that time to just do dumber and dumber stuff, like you got to start making sure that this stuff is safe because, like, your wrestlers are a commodity. Mm-hmm. Like, you you lose these people. I know you can push somebody else up in their spot, but you've invested a lot of time and effort into that. And they've invested a lot of time and effort in, and like she's been taking some like big bumps onto piles of chairs, and that spot almost killed her. And then, mm-hmm. but then look at AEW, there's like Danielson got took that move from Sammy. Sammy's hurt people before. 
yeah. with stuff. He's he's just not super safe with stuff. And Danielson, you know he's not going to do something wrong, but he got need right in the orbital. So even Danielson, if he would have broken his orbital bone, he's out. Yeah. Like, just a little while. I mean, even it takes even a while to allow them to come back if they have a mask. Because yeah. that can ruin your sight. And so I don't know if he cracked his orbital or what happened, but he definitely got... But plus, it's not like Danielson doesn't have concussion issues. Yeah. Like, there needs to be somebody that stands up and just says, okay, this is... Re- like, it's okay to push the envelope, but be, don't be an idiot about it. They need to yeah. start being friends or something. Because... One, it's not special. You do it every week. And I kind of understand it more with AEW because they don't have pay-per-views as often. Right. But I would save it for like a once-a-month thing. Allow people to use tables or chairs once a month for blood. Because it was every week for a while. And yeah. it's the same thing. Like, save it save it for a pay-per-view. It's not as much as it used to be because there's no buy rate. Because everything's right. on the but still, like, man. So save the table for Luchasaurus to do a show slam through. Every yeah. Now and then. Yeah, I would say save the blood for Moxley, but he started bleeding when he sneezes. But, uh, yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It's like they're trying to get as much bang for their buck as they can when you're going to get just as big a reaction and a lot better feedback if you're making it more about the psychology than about the actual high spots. Yeah, I mean... You can do a triple windy or a 450 or whatever off the top of a ladder, but there's no there's no why to it. Like, no, it, you don't know why they're there. If it's somebody that, say, I was going to throw a hypothetical out there. Let's say Adam Cole threw uh, Jungle Boy off the top of a ladder through a table and put him on the shelf for six months then six months later it comes around and say jungle boy is a surprise entry like the joker in the ladder match at a pay-per-view and adam cole's in the match then if jungle boy jumps off the top of a ladder on the cole through a table you know why yeah and it makes sense nowadays people are just doing it because it's like look what i can do like yelling at your mom at the swimming pool while you're on the high dive yeah well perfect example one of the a Young Bucks versus Lucha Brothers matches. They did like a, they did a flipping pile driver off the top through tables, and there was a kick out. Drove me nuts. I remember it. And they, they all should have got fined for that. Did they really? No, I said they should have. Oh yeah, I would have fined them. Fine them, fine them all five thousand dollars for yeah. stupidity. Yeah. But like, just it's not just killing moves. It's just you're killing your talent. Like, and if you're allowing them to just kill themselves, you're not doing your job. You've got to protect them from themselves sometimes. Because especially younger people, people in their twenties and early thirties that feel like they're invincible. Like I remember those feelings. Like, but I re- I, I know what it's like to get up now. Like we were like all young and dumb, young and dumb once. You have all these guys who are wrestling way, but they were wrestling a different way. And these younger guys, they're not they're not gonna make fifty years old. They're they're not gonna make forty not, not comfortably. No. If if they do, they're gonna be riding a rascal around and you know I you guarantee you in five years Sammy Guevara is not gonna be doing stuff off the top. No. It, he's not going to be able to, no. and Ricochet, Ricochet will eventually not be able to do the things he does, and he's not even as nearly as dangerous as Ricochet. Is probably he's the cleanest of any of the guys. Like he's pretty pretty clean. I think the only one who I think has better body control than Ricochet right now is Pac. Yeah. Well, even AJ Styles will will tell you the reason that he now hits like if he does a springboard four fifty, he hits it. Because it started to hurt too bad if you missed it. Yeah. So he realized that there are some things you do when you're younger that just come back to get you. And that I just it it just bugs me that 
they're giving it for away for free and they're allowing their talent to do that and it's just it just seems like such a waste yeah it's like why why buy the cow when you get the sex for free right <laughs> yes <laughs> although i i wouldn't hate seeing aj do a spiral tap one more time it's it's been about 10 years since i've seen him do it yeah i was hoping he would do that i think it was him versus was it him versus danielson i was hoping he would do it or him versus somebody else. It might have been him and Edge and Mania. At least that's when the last time I thought about yeah. it. That's what I was like. Yeah, this, I'm hoping he pulls it out, but he didn't. No. But that's a hard move to do from what it looks like. I would imagine. Yeah. I, I can't do anything from the <laughs> top row. So. I heard you did a pretty mean big splash back in the day. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do. I would do middle ropes, but I never want to get up on top. I just I, I, I always, don't have the balance for the top rope. Just gonna fall. I yep. just gonna fall and it's just gonna hurt. So just do a misty plunge, you know, just put the arms up and just fall backwards. Yeah. <laughs> then throw your back out. Yeah. But I digress. But yeah, that's a that was a, an interesting topic to bring up, Gary. I'm glad you did because I think it needed to be discussed. Uh when I saw that spot with uh, Liv and Raquel, it reminded me of, uh, I don't tell me if you remember this, La Resistance and Spike Dudley on Raw. When they did that double choke slam over the ropes to the floor, but they didn't clear Spike's feet. So Spike hit the base of his skull on the edge of the table. I thought he killed him. Yeah, he, I, I, that's because Spike's invincible, apparently. Spike, I, I think Spike just goes, knows how to make his body go limp and take all of the punishment, and then just get up and been dead like that. Buff Bagwell took less impact on that oh, on the bulldog. Like it just, boop, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Gary yep. done work. <laughs> yeah. All right, so Gary, we got a couple more things to get into before we call it a show here. Uh. Number one, uh, we did this last uh, last episode for the first time, and that is the uh, the Jumping the Rail Hall of Fame. And if you remember the last episode, we put in the uh, eighth wonder of the world, Andre the Giant, as our first inductee, and I th- I think well deserved. And uh, the guy I've got for this week, it kind of goes along with our Montreal screw job discussion, and it's not Brett, and it's not Sean, but. Uh, it's, I think, the most talented member of the Hart family, and that is this guy. Oh, yeah, he's definitely the, the best. Rocket. Owen Hart. I mean, Fine. for my money, he he was so much – I thought he was better than Brett back in 94. Uh, if you watch Owen's Jap- Japanese stuff when he first started, it's in mm-hmm. – he was doing stuff that nobody else was doing. Like, well, I mean – I mean, he, he did a lot of stuff that maybe Dino did, just because he was he'd seen oh, it. Calgary guys, yeah, he was. But, but he was working Liger and guys like that over there too. Yeah, he was putting it together differently, yeah. and he was so smooth. And as a worker, he was definitely the best heart. And as a character, he was definitely the best heart. So mm-hmm. if we're going with his best heart, yeah, bye. By a considerable distance, it's it's oh, yeah. and yeah, and I love that. But Brett's character was okay at best. Yeah, it was fine for what it was. He was he was being himself, but, but then Owen had that over the top. Like he could be an obnoxious heel, or he could be the fiery baby face if you wanted to. Yeah, and the stuff he did with, uh, not even the stuff he did with Austin, which was awesome in '97, but. When he was teaming with Bulldog in like '96, when they beat the Smoking Guns, and then they would do the thing where he was saying he was in charge of the team and all this, and he was playing the heel, and Bulldog was like a pseudo baby face, and then just everything he did, he could make everybody get invested in it. And if you think about, like, you look at what happened with like Austin Theory yesterday, uh, and I'm not saying he's as good as Owen Hart because who are we kidding? He's not. But Austin Theory finally got 
people interested in him yesterday on Raw. He dissed all the fluff, you know, the uh, cell phone, and obviously he doesn't have the briefcase anymore. But he got he got serious and just became it. Just started kicking ass last night. Beat the shit out of Dolph. Beat the shit out of Seth, and got people like organically booing him for the first time instead of just saying, "Oh, this guy's annoying as hell. I don't want him on my TV." They were actually booing him for what he was doing to the baby faces yesterday. Yeah, yeah, and it's a sh- it's a shame that that had to happen to Dolph because. That guy, if anybody deserves anything, he deserves more. Guy is has everything you ask for plus plus. <laughs> like he can work, he can look, he can talk on the mic, he can be a face, he can be a heel. He's like the mini version of the big show. If, just, if there's if there's anybody on that roster right now that reminds me of Owen Hart, it's Dolph Ziggler. Yeah. For the ring yeah. work, for the personality, for the just the talent, you know. He's like a he's like a glorious mixture of Owen Hart, Shawn Michaels, and Kurt Hennig all rolled into one. Well, I mean, the, what's crazy is the three of those guys you just mentioned. What separates them is Shawn Michaels somehow was actually able to climb that mountain, and at the time, Shawn was climbing that mountain, even though he was an incredible worker, he wasn't the best worker of the three. It was either perfect or Owen, because man, Kurt Henning, real good. <laughs> yeah, he good. Real good. Uh, yeah, I think out of the two though, I, I got to go Owen though. Between Owen, and- yeah, man, Owen was so good. He just everything he did was just crisp, and it was, and it was, it was almost I would call it buttery. It was just, it was smooth and. It always had a purpose. He never just threw something in just because. And he was able to work with everybody. He was in the nation of domination. <laughs> yes. It wasn't like it wasn't like you you could throw him into anything and he was going to get over. And uh would Not he have like ever Sami no. Yeah. Would he have ever been champion? No. I don't think Vince would have ever made him champion. See, I think he, I think there was still room for that to happen if what happened didn't happen. At the yeah, it would have been rough after the whole blue blazer thing, but he might I have think been. That, I think it could have turned back around. Yeah, and he could have gotten, he could have gotten there. Uh, I like to think so anyway, because I think it's a horrible injustice that he was never a world champion somewhere. Yeah, but instead, you know, we got from that whole situation, Jeff Jarrett being a 90-time judge. Oh, <laughs> uh, Double J. Hey, they were a fun tag team, too, though, Double J and Owen. Yeah. When they had uh, Deborah with them. It was the only time I really liked Jarrett. Actually, I didn't like Jarrett ever until probably these last year and a half because his character is actually development. Like his yeah. work is, is dirtier and grittier. It's not just him doing the same stuff over and over. Him being yeah. the same for it's different. I'll tell and, you what. The uh, the match was the shit. The uh, the flare match at the pay per view. Um, the build the build up was magnificent. Oh yeah, it was great. And most of that has to do with Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. If you listen to, I don't know if you ever listened to his podcast with Conrad, but they were like, there were parts of that podcast where they would get heated. They would you know they were doing doing some work, you know, because yeah. Conrad's Rick's son-in-law, and yeah, they were oh. they'd go back and forth, and Jerry what? just really put his cards on the table on that show. Like Flair said, you know, is, is hinting at that might not have been his last match. Somebody needs to sedate him. <laughs> yeah, well, just they need to start like slipping something into his herb, man. Because he's he's got to stop. Because anybody who's still telling him that that match was good, or just signing him on, he almost died. Yeah, he then he passed out twice. Yeah, 
Yeah, he so was not doing much. He he, he wasn't, wasn't overdoing he, it or anything. He's just old and not well. Just, yeah. He's like, well, I didn't drink enough water. Blair, how long have you been doing this? <laughs> <laughs> what? What? What, kid? <laughs> Oh god! Oh man, we could. No, that's awful. But yeah, I, I, I agree. Owen, I'm glad Owen finally went into a Hall of Fame. I. That's another one of those subjects. Is two sides. I can see why Martha wants absolutely nothing to do with WWF. Um, because I've watched documentaries and I've watched different things and I've read different things and it all doesn't really point to like last minute just slip aside hiring people that really weren't at the top of their game and yeah. the cost of husband or luck is luck. Right. And I can see, hey, I don't want anything to do with this company. So I don't know what Tony Khan said to her. To get that uh, one uh, I think a, a lot of it, I think, had to do with poning up the money to her uh, foundation well, that for didn't. the charity, which I'm sure, and I'm playing devil's advocate again, if that was a condition for Martha, say, hey, Vince, I'll let you put Owen in the Hall of Fame, but I want you to donate to our charity. If they do enough charity work in WWE, they probably would have done that in a heartbeat. Yeah. No pun intended. But, uh, but yeah, so, I mean, Obviously, Martha is going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to falter for that, but it, I didn't think it was kind of, uh, I don't want to say petty. I don't know what the right word is for her to go and do business with another wrestling company when she basically, from what I've always heard, just hated the pro wrestling business in general. And not just WWE. She hated that Owen was wrestling and wanted him to stop all the time. And then she goes out on AEW and goes on and on about how much she was enjoying herself. And, and, and I don't blame her for enjoying wrestling. I, I, we both do. But it just seemed like she was talking out of both sides of her face. And, and I'm not trying to say that. To, I don't want to get letters from people shaming a widow or anything. Because I can't fathom what she was, what she's gone through over the last 25 years. Yeah. But uh, I, I think you know, at the, the other side, of, and if Vince would have been just transparent about it from the beginning and just said, hey, I screwed up, and he paid a big settlement yeah. like he should have done. Yeah. There's and, uh, there's and, always the there's always the what if. And everybody, there's, there's not a right answer or a wrong answer to this, but everybody always, most people I've talked about this say the same thing, but I want to hear what you say. Should they have stopped the show after the accident? Oh, I would have just because the dude died. Like, and they knew something really bad had happened. Like, they, I know there people said, well, he hadn't died yet. Well, once right, you figured I, that out. I think he was technically still alive when they got him out of the ring. But so. once you figured that out, you, you now have an entire crowd that has seen somebody die. You have a dead sense of blood on the ring. Mm -hmm. You have. I think there's a divot in the, in the ring. Yeah, you have people in the back who not only just work with this guy, they love this dude. Like, he was popular with everybody. Yeah. And so then you're just like, no, we're just going to keep doing this shit. Uh, we, I don't care how you feel. Th these people pay for money. Well, you know what? There are things more important than money. Uh, can I, uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate here. And like I said, I'm not, I have no skin in the game or anything. Is it possible that the pay-per-view company told Vince to keep going? It's like, hey, no. I mean, we we're paying you for this time for a show. I mean, it's just I'm, easy to say, hey. I'm sure there might have been a fine assist or something if they if they didn't give them a certain amount of time, because I know sometimes they can get fined for going over right. time because they're taking up other time from somebody else. So that could have been part of it. And I know he wasn't making like a metric ton of money at the time. No. Well, he wasn't making bad money. I think that was the middle of the attitude era. So he was making much better money. 
It wasn't a so, huge buy. It wasn't a huge pay per view. It was over the edge. It wasn't like it was SummerSlam or WrestleMania. I I think maybe the right thing would have been something in the middle that he would have came out on the stage or into the ring, explained to the crowd what happened, mm -hmm. refunds for anybody who wanted a refund, wanted to leave. No will go on, but we had to let you know what happened because we respect you and we respect mm -hmm. Owen, but this the show will continue. And and on it because we think that's what he would have wanted. Even if you said something like that. But I think one of the things that Martha said that I agreed with completely was so this horrible accident happens, they take him to the hospital, the show continues, and then they basically make the police wait hours to investigate the scene of a possible crime and a death. And then you're waiting for people to leave the ring. So instead mm -hmm. of having to go up yeah, they, possible scene. Yeah, that's that's a that's a part that doesn't get talked about a lot. It's like what if that was a crime scene? You know, that's that's yeah. kind of a, that's kind of a uh, a can of worms there. They didn't know was, yeah, and what you were saying about if Vince would have come out and give, done that, talked to it on the top of the stage, all that. I think that's something. If that was an ECW show, I think Paul would have done that. Yeah, that's and very much in Paul's wheelhouse. What's different to me about it was it was a stunt done by a non stunt man that went wrong. Mm -hmm. Like when o Austin broke his neck. And they drug him out, or when Draws broke his neck, or and the show continued, or when Buff broke his neck, you know, the show continued. But that was a wrestler in a wrestling ring doing wrestling mm -hmm. moves. Yeah. That something bad happened. Yeah. And then you can, he didn't, you know, but I'm fairly sure once Masawa died in the ring, they didn't complete that show. Well, I think that was the main event, though. Yeah, that might have been. Yeah, but, but might stop the match early, but you know, I mean, and not making a lot of masala because, and that was just a free thing. That was just a back suplex he just landed wrong. Well, I, I think it was just too many years of landing. Well, wear and tear, yeah. Neck in your head. Yeah, Masawa was kind of the king of the. Oh, apologies to Nakamura. He was the king of strong style in Japan. Oh yeah, but I, I was super sad that day. Masawa was my favorite. Oh, I was, I was stunned. I was always a Kabashi guy in uh, in Noah. Kenta Kabashi which, was my guy, but Masawa was right up there. Which is funny because all my friends, like they, they all had their their. Once we started watching All Japan and New Japan, we all had a guy. Mine was <laughs> Josh's was, was uh, Kawada. Nice, yeah. Justin's was uh, Kobashi. Somebody really liked Jun Akiyama. Um, there was even somebody for like Ogawa or one of those guys, but yeah, it was everybody had their favorite, and it was usually because they like Josh liked that, like the little head kicks, the water kicks. Mm -hmm. and I just love the rolling elbow, and so there, there was had something for everybody, but then that was really before we started watching Hanson, and then we all just fell in love with Stan Hansen, right? Stan Hansen. Yeah. I became a fan of Kabashi after this match with Samoa Joe in Ring of Honor. Oh, then you went back? <laughs> yeah, then I had to go back because I didn't see a lot of Fall Japan back before like, 2000, 2005. Then, then you had to watch him get beat for like five years by Masao. <laughs> yeah, I watched a lot of Masao matches. The one he had where he finally beat Masao, oh, uh, Burning man. Hammer in the middle of the ring. Uh, that roof, like for a Japanese crowd. That was the hottest crowd and reaction I've ever heard. Because when he hit that and got that pin, that place went insane. Yeah. Because it was, it was the it was a buildup of years and years and years. Yeah. Just smokes getting there. It made Raven and Dreamer look like a walk in the park. <laughs> yes, it did. But also I mean, Kabashi, he only did that move like what eight times in his career, the Burning Hammer. Yeah. Well, it was kind of like uh, that was like his in case of emergency break glass finish. Yeah. <laughs> well, Misawa had the. Yeah, uh, was, 90, was it two or ninety one? 
Tiger Driver 98, I think. Yeah. Well, it might have been 91. But he, he only so did Tiger Drivers. Because that was really dumb. Yeah. Just drop a fight on your head, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, everybody had their in case of emergency break glass move. And then eventually Misawa got the Emerald Corrosion. Yeah. And the, um, Kobashi had the Orange Crush Bomb. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, he would break that out. Then he'd do that like, sleeper suplex, too. Yeah. <laughs> that half Nelson sleeper suplex. Madness. Oh, he did yeah. that to Joe. Samoa Joe was 300 pounds and he did it to him. Well, Kobashi's not a small dude. <laughs> no. Kobashi was a stud, man. They all learned that physique from the Road Warriors. Yeah. Road Warriors came over and they taught them how to work out. Yeah. Which mm-hmm. probably would probably require a little more than just weights. <laughs> a little pharmaceutical enhancement, maybe? Maybe. maybe they all got Zubas to go with the Ribera Steakhouse jackets. Well, that's what it was. It's Zubas and Ribera Steakhouse jackets. That's why we're not really smart. We only, <laughs> you only have one of the two. Right. Although I did I, find on, e- on eBay, they have Ribera jackets for like 60 bucks. On eBay? On eBay. Ribera so I thought about it. It looks like the uh, like the Ribera Steakhouse jackets. And they add, does it have Ribera on it or? Yeah, I'll have to oh. send you a link. But I mean, it's been it's been considered by me. I haven't uh, pulled the trigger. I think I might get a look from the wife if I <laughs> buy a, a jacket yeah. from a Japanese steakhouse because wrestlers wear them. <laughs> That's a yeah. I, yeah, I think I'd probably get a look too. <laughs> That's all right. But anyway, Owen Hart, all of Owen Hart, yes. <laughs> you're you're very good at getting us back on track, Gary. I appreciate that. Not super good, but good enough. <laughs> you're getting there. All right, so we got a few more minutes here, Gary, and uh, it's time for. I'm just going to call it now. It's the part of the show that's going to get me a lot of heat from people when they hear what we got. It is time for Top Ten Tuesday. Brought to you by ProWrestlingTees.com slash JTRPod for all your jumping the rail merchandise needs. I'm getting pretty good at this shilling stuff here. And our topic this week, the greatest WWF or WWE tag teams. And I've always, I've done a a version of this list before, but I've always done like best of the 90s or best of the 80s. You know, I just figured the hell with it. I was going to do all overall. You know, why not? And, uh, We'll see what I come up with here. And most of it, everybody on this list has held the world titles at least twice on here. And this isn't a list of my favorite tag teams because this would be a very different list, just as a disclaimer. So we're going to start with our number 10, Undertaker and Kane, uh, two-time WWF tag team champions, WCW tag team champions, plus one of the more over acts in the company for – well, ever, you know, yeah. for a good Brother. 20 years. And uh, I liked them as a tag team, especially in the uh, invasion angle when they were going with uh, uh, Page and Canyon in the cage at SummerSlam. And, yeah. Uh, basically, just them stopping Page and Canyon from running away for 15 minutes before they finally just killed them. Uh, kind of sucked they got stuck working Chronic at the, at the next pay-per-view, which I like. I liked Chronic in WCW, but they were not the same Chronic in September yeah, 2001. That, yeah, I don't know how that translated so badly. I, sure. That might have been Taker doing a favor for his buddy uh, Crush, getting him, getting him a booking. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so they're number 10. Uh, some people might say they're too low on the list. Some people might say they're too high on the list. It's hard to say. Uh, number nine, uh, going way back to the 70s. Mr. <laughs> Fuji and Professor Tanaka, they're with the Hollywood fashion plate, pretty blasty there, giving the uh, Donald Trump sign, you know, thumbs up. <laughs> and uh, three time uh, tag champs, and not. Not counting the uh, other, like two or three times Fuji held it with uh, Saito, but uh, they were one of those dominant tag teams. This is back, bef- I think, a little before the Samoans got there, 
like around the time the Valiant Brothers and the Strongbows, all those like real tough tag teams back in the 70s. <coughs> but, uh, excuse me, I'll cough into my banjo. And, uh, but yeah, it's just, there was two fail safes if you wanted to be a really effective heel in the 70s, either be Russian or be Japanese. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's... In, the 60s, in the 60s, it was be a German. Yes. Yeah. But 70s, it was Japanese or Russian. And that was, uh, that was a fail safe. And Fuji did it so well. Tanaka was more of just, you know, the, and he was odd job in uh, the James Bond pictures. So, but Fuji just, he was one of my favorite heels just because he was such a, a dirty bastard with the salt and the, Chops to the throat, all that stuff. But yeah, so I got them at number nine. I would have had, I might have had them higher, but you know, just they were from a, a, a bygone era, if you will. Uh, unlike these guys, my number eight, the aforementioned Wild Samoans, uh, Afa and Sika here. Later on, they would have a third, which was Samu from the Head Shrinkers. But uh, this was before the Bloodline. These guys were the Bloodline. You know, they were. Three time tag champs managed by Captain Wu and yeah. uh, pretty much ran every tag division they were ever a part of. Uh, the Crockett's, uh, Hawaii, San Francisco, uh, McMahon, you know. And uh, they were main eventing a lot of the shows back then, like at the Garden or whenever they make the loop. They were tag teaming with in the main event, either with the uh, tag teams depending on the titles or they would just work like Andre and Snuka or Rocky Johnson or you know, whoever. But they were such a cool act, just with their look and their style and everything. And uh, I think that's why I liked the Head Shrinkers when they came around in the 90s, because it was kind of a throwback to that. Which is kind of, you don't get that out of a lot of Samoan wrestlers these days. I mean, you get a little bit of that out of Jacob Fatu in uh, MLW. But it was kind of like, this was like the groundbreaking like tag team, you know, the Samoans. So I had to put them on there. Uh, I would, I probably could have had them a little bit higher, to be honest with you, but uh, that's not the last Samoan tag team you'll see on this list. So let's move on to number seven. This is the first one I think that's going to get me in trouble. I got the Hardys at number seven, and if it was up to me, I would have had them lower. Uh, but uh, six-time champs, I've never really been a fan of the Hardys, per se. Just trying to be a fan of their style. But, you know, success speaks for itself, you know. <coughs> Never been in. Like, when they first came out, they were kind of different. Yeah. That first, I mean, you had those, that first ladder match that was nobody ever seen. But then after that, everything was the same. Like, they, they were as formulaic as you could possibly get. And, it, yeah, I just never cared. After that, honestly, like my my team during that time was the Dudleys. They were just they were really good. Yeah, I, I like I like the Dudleys too back then. I, I mean, I still do. But the, yeah, the Hardys they were they were for the ladies. You know, the girls liked them because they take their shirts off and had the long hair and did the flippy shit and all that. So, but they were a big deal in the in the attitude era. So they got they made the list. Uh, number six, uh, I would have had these guys higher, but they didn't really work like a tag team per se. Road Dog and Billy, we've talked about that before, Gary. Hated them. They <laughs> never did any tag team moves. That they the, they had the tag team championships. I don't know how many times. I'm sure you uh, do. Seven times, uh, six or seven times. Six or seven times. Didn't have a tandem finisher. Didn't have any tandem moves. It was just two dudes out wrestling. And the only thing they would do together was cut a promo at the very beginning of the match. Yeah. And honestly, that was mostly Road Dog. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I guess if you're not down with that. Yeah, I guess. But now who's, who's laughing because of Billy Guns, the most over thing in AEW right now? Billy Guns, Billy Guns working, talking, moving is better than he's ever been. I actually yeah. enjoy it. It's impressive. Like it, it really is. Modern science, man. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> gotta be gotta be yeah. conductors. 
<laughs> yes. Can't think uh, of anything else to be giving 50 plus year old men those kind of muscles. Yeah, and I'm it, not sure how old he is. Like 50, I don't know if he's 54, maybe a little older. Oh, yeah, he's but golden. He looks like a, he's built like a brick shit house. Just, I'm just going to say it. Let, to get an idea of maybe what I'm talking about, Sting is like 60 something. Uh -huh. But he wrestles with his shirt on. And I'm sure he's mm -hmm. still working out. I'm sure. But he, he doesn't but tell he, him. He apparently, he has not found this well of uh, Don Quixote. <laughs> that I mean, Ponce, Ponce de Leon, the captain of you. Not Don Quixote. Don, Don Quixote. Quixote. Yeah. Well, <laughs> he was tilting at windmills, but Ponce de Leon was, was uh, trying to find the fountain of you. Well, I'll tell you who found the fountain of youth is Action Mike Jackson. He's 70 some years old. He's still working. Oh, really? Yeah, he was a junior heavyweight enhancement guy in in Carolinas and Alabama in the 80s. And wow. he's still, he, he beat Joey Janela at GCW a few months ago. Of course he did. <laughs> I think everybody has. But, but anyway, so the uh, next edition of the Going to Get Into a Lot of Trouble for this choice. It's my number five, and we kind of talked about him a little bit earlier. I got the Hart Foundation, number five. Uh, Two-time champs. I liked them best, I think, in that second title run when they beat Demolition at SummerSlam 2 out of 3 Falls. Yeah. But I was always more of an Anvil guy. My brother was a big Brett guy. I liked Anvil because he was funny looking and he laughed like a psycho. And uh, But yeah, they were an awesome tag team and a era of awesome tag teams. Uh, again, not my favorite tag team back then. I was a strike force guy, believe it or not, in the late 80s. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, of course I was? I liked Tito Santana back when I was a kid. He was I thought he was Ch awesome. Chico Santana. Chico Santana, the, uh, the burrito salesman in Tijuana, as Jesse Ventura would say. <laughs> Which you can't say now, and I'm regretting paraphrasing. Uh, not now. Not, it's uh, not the thoughts or the the feelings of jumping. <laughs> no, Jesse, the opinions <laughs> of Jesse Ventura do not reflect those of the JTR Podcast Network. And clear of all problems. All right, but uh, no, the Heart Foundation. Uh, I thought they were good. I don't think they were the be all end all in that era. It probably would have been the Bulldogs, but they didn't make this list because they only held the titles once, and they spent a lot of their time hurt in the late 80s. But that's that's neither here nor there. All right, let's move on to number four. We just mentioned him a few minutes ago. There you go. The, uh, got the Dudleys in the number four. Uh, I think I've got them number four because they weren't a homegrown WWF tag team. Everybody else on this list was made in WWF as I like, teamed up together. But the Dudleys are the ones that came over from ECW. They were already eight-time champs there. They won another eight or nine championships in WWE, WWF. And, uh, and then who knows how many they won in Impact in Japan afterwards. <coughs> you better get you better get done, man. You're gonna talk I'm 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 fighting through. I'm gonna I'm gonna make it. I'm still uh I'm kicking out of this uh, COVID booster backlash here. But uh, at least I didn't cough into the banjo this time. But the uh, boys, Gerald. I was trying to see if there's anybody on our on our Facebook, not Facebook, but YouTube. Oh, I think they're a little tardy. They'll, uh, I'm sure I'll hear about it from Dwayne. I think Dwayne might be not home. That's why he's not listening to this. Yeah. So we got top four now. Top yeah, three. Number four. We're, number four. We're talking about the Dudleys, and then. Uh, and we already talked about how much we love the Dudleys. The Dudleys are a team that I know a lot of people talk well about them, but they're they're probably the most criminally underrated tag team. They were just really good. They had tandem maneuvers, mm -hmm. promos. They had character work. They could be face or they could be heel. They sacrificed their bodies. They made. People look good in the ring with them. Um, 
they did everything you're supposed to do as a tag team. Yeah. And uh, for, for my money, best tag team finish of all time, that 3D. Oh, yeah, 3D. Yeah, it's just, it's, in, it's in very impressive. I only but, kicked out of once, ever. Yeah, that, was, that was just... That was by the Machine Guns in their last match. Oh, that's right. Well, last match, finger quotes, because, yeah. you know... Is there ever really a last match in pro wrestling? Which is a shame because I don't really like either one of the machine guns, but that's okay. Really? I always like yeah. Howard Shelley. I thought Shelley was fun to watch. Still is. At the... If I had to pick, Shelley would be money back. Yeah. All right. Let's go to number three. Another one probably people say, why aren't they hired? Boom. Oh. This was, these guys were the top tag team when I first started watching wrestling. Like, well, a little after, by 88. But three-time champs, uh, not wildly popular with the company nowadays, not, as I not understand kids. it. They weren't KISS either. No. Everybody says they were Road Warrior ripoffs. I never saw that. No, they were just you know, KISS ripoffs. <laughs> yeah. With a little Judas Priest. Well, yeah, with a little Priest. But yeah, but, yeah just... everybody says they looked and acted like the road. They didn't wrestle like the Road Warriors. They didn't look like the Road Warriors. They didn't talk like the Road Warriors. No, they if were anybody always... was if anybody was a Road Warrior ripoff in the WWF, it was the Powers of Pain. Yeah, <laughs> they were pretty much a carbon copy Road Warriors from the haircuts to the tights to the you know they were big muscle guys. The Demolition were big strong guys, but they were not bodybuilders like the Road Warriors were. No. And their finish was, was a very underwhelming were, finish, if you ask me, too. The uh, elbow, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm now I'm hoping the Beverly Brothers are number one. <laughs> I'm sorry, the Beverly Brothers did not make the cut. <laughs> if it was the greatest AWA tag teams, they would have got on there, you know, the destruction crew. Wayne was it Wayne Bloom and Mike Enos? Mike Enos. Mike Enos. Mike Enos yeah. the guy who was in the ring when Scott Hall debuted. The only reason I know that is because when they came to D WCW, they went by their real names. Yes. I had to figure out why they mattered. They're like, it's Wayne Bloom and Mike Enos. And I'm like, who's that? And then I'm like, why does that matter? <laughs> it's like, why are they getting so excited about the Beverly Brothers showing up here? <sighs> All right, so yeah, so demolitions by number three, and they were pretty dominant back in the late eighties, but they didn't have a long run. They were only for a couple of couple of years before they kind of Axe finally his body kind of failed him that he had to give it up, and they brought in Crush. It wasn't quite the same, you know. So so that's why they're on number three. Number two, I think, is an easy one. Edge and Christian. Uh, any team that can win the World Tag Team Championship seven times in one year is, is pretty crazy. Yeah. Because yeah. you look at their resume, you think they were together for years. They only teamed up for about two years. Yeah. And the crazy thing, I mean, like we were talking about earlier, I think part of that was there was really only like three teams like doing like this dance with each other. And so you mm -hmm. were just back and forth between the Dudleys the Hardys, because that's what was making money at the time was just yeah. those guys putting on just phenomenal match. I mean, to shorten careers. Well, not really. I mean, some they're all still working. Not some yeah, of them too. Paused better. some careers. Yeah. What? It paused some careers. Edge and Christian both took several years off in between, like when they made their comeback. Yeah, but, Jeff Hardy retired years ago. Yeah. That dude is just a, a mass of injuries. Yeah, and he's a, also a mess of bad decisions. Oh, yeah, those outweigh just, the injuries. If anybody, if anybody can be considered their own worst enemy, it is Jeff Hardy. But yeah. How do we get back on the Hardys? We, we were number seven for a reason. Yeah. But yeah, Edge and Christian, they were my favorite. Like, as much as I love the Dudleys, uh, Edge and Christian was my favorite because they were just so so goofy back then. Oh, with, they with the pose and the the way they would do their interviews and everything. It was just entertaining to me. 
The stuff with Angle. Kirk Angel. <laughs> Kirk Angel, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes they would uh, work with Mr. Roboto. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, totally. Jer- uh, Jericho always had the the really hip references for the uh, wrestling fans in 2000. But, uh, but yeah, so I think Edge and Christian is a strong number two. Insert joke there. Uh, so my number one, I think, is going to get me a lot of heat. But it makes sense to me just for longevity, for success, for what they've, what they've been doing. A number one tag team, and I don't have a drum roll, we've, so just imagine one. you got to put the Usos number one right now. Yeah, right now, yeah. And this, these lists are so subjective; they can change one week to another. But right now, I mean, there's there's no better team than the Usos in WWE. Yeah. Over over all time, I would definitely put the New Day ahead of them, just because of the amount of time not amount of time they were champions, but just the amount of times they've been champions. And since they were able to do that with three different men. And stay together as long as they have. Like that that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Like, yeah, right and now the Usos are the top of the WWE Hill. Yeah. They Which a lot of uh, thought to put in the new day on there, but the reason I didn't is because they were three guys. Yeah. And they didn't have the same two guys holding the titles every time. I uh I don't I guess I I understand Roman having the titles as long as he's had more, I don't get it. I I would have def I would have dropped belts to I would have dropped the belt to Edge at Mania because he was so. hot. Yeah, he was hot, and you don't know how long you got him. Hmm, that's and true. You don't need to capitalize on that, and apparently you only had him like two three years, hmm. and they haven't done anything really with him. He they, he could have been your champion. He could have at least done TVs. If I was if I was going to take the belt off Roman, I would have put it on Drew at the uh, Clash at the Castle. Oh, or that, yeah, because Drew deserves it. And I'm just tired. I I think if I wasn't so tired of even in their oositude, oh. <laughs> their oositude, their, their oosiness, um, and it's kind of reinvigorated some interest in them, but man, they have just been beating me over the head with the Usos and Roman Reigns and the Bloodline, and I'm just I don't care. Here's don't. the thing: there's there's not a lot of strong tag team contenders in the WWE right now to take the titles off the Usos. I mean, Montez got, is hurt, so Street Profits are out for the time being. But they've um, had time. To create tag teams, and they haven't even done that. Yeah, but the problem is they they're doing it wrong. And here's what yeah. I mean: I mean, they're putting guys together, but they're trying to fast track it before these guys. Like back in the day, they would put two guys together on the house show loop for yeah a few weeks, let them build up their chemistry, get their tag, get their moves set, and all that. Now they're just going straight to TV, and if they're not gelling with their chemistry. <laughs> the fans are just going to shit on it immediately, and then there's no coming back from that. And I think that RK Bro was, I think, the exception to the rule. Maybe yeah. American, maybe Alpha Academy. It feels so, like Randy got really hurt or something, but yeah, Alpha yeah. Academy, they were Chad Gable, dude's a stud. He's awesome. Stud. He, he has every uh, every ability that Kurt Angle had. He's got comedy now. He knows how to cut a promo now. He, he is knows how to play that crowd like a fiddle. Strong as an ox. Yeah. That dude is dumb and stupid. He can throw anybody. He could probably and throw Lesnar if he wanted to. Otis, who is just a wrecking ball, that yeah. team won the title. Well, they yeah. did have a title, didn't they? They did it for a little bit. And then they lost it, but I mean, Absolutely. I don't, I don't know why they're the job team. My, they're almost my, like the gatekeepers now. 
my my thing is I I think they need to actually bring along with kayfabe coming back they need to bring back jobbers not like Dolph Ziggler jobbers like guys who you like know local are, enhancement guys like Brooklyn Brawler like, like guys, Brawler. yeah looking that work in the back basically but every once in a while you bring them out for enhancement like now they just get the indie guys when they need and that's fine too if you want to just hire guys from indies right. that day of yeah, go ahead and do that. But I want to see that more because then that helps protect people. Yeah. And if you want Dolph Ziggler to get a win, you have him come up and be an enhancement guy. Give him five yeah. minutes. Then. Can I tell you what I want to see happen? So Theory beats the shit out of Dolph last night. Put some, it seems like they've figured out for a while. Austin needs to come out next week talking about Seth, about what he did. Then he needs to get the, uh, a run in from one Robert Roode. Come get a little payback for his buddy, because Rude's one of those guys that can really make theory in the ring. Yeah, you know, he'll he'll make him look great. He'll put him over to the moon. And uh, they're not doing much with Rude right now for whatever reason. I think he's working young guys on like the house shows, or I don't know. I think he was he was charged with uh, coming up like helping Veer uh, find his feet on the on the road. Didn't really work out so well. I mean, Veer's back in NXT now, but. Yeah, well, <laughs> that'll happen. Yeah. Well, oh, hey, we got a comment uh, on the as we're about to say good night here, uh, David Rocha. How long do you think it will take to break the USO's reign? Three to five years, or will it be the next generation in a decade or so? I, I don't think it'll be that long. I, mean, I, I could, I think it's just, in my opinion, and I know he's hurt for uh, for a little while. Eventually, saying he's going to get the boot from the bloodline. It just. You know, it's coming. So then I, I think it's going to be him and Owens to beat the Usos and take those yeah. titles. I mean, it makes sense. And then yeah. it, it's going to be Kevin because they haven't done anything with Owens in a long time. So I think they're kind of saving him. And well, you see, I think, I think they said as much. What? I think that, I think they said it was they were going to pull the trigger on Sammy, but then he got over like, doing the bloodline. Yeah. So there's so they stretch, they're stretching it out more. But I yeah. think that was the plan, is to get Sammy out, but it was KO. Well, when you're that Usy. You... Yeah. The, the Usy is strong with uh, with Sammy Zayn. Well, Gary, this it went a little bit longer than we usually do, but uh, I think we uh, covered some good topics here. Uh, maybe stirred up a little controversy. If you guys uh, didn't catch this live, and if you did, we appreciate it. This will still be on our uh, Jumping the Rail YouTube channel. And it will drop on the podcast on Thursday morning if you want to check it out. And uh, we will, uh, of course, next week we won't be uh, be on. It's our off week. But we hope you guys have a good uh, Thanksgiving holiday. And uh, don't eat yourself too crazy like I'm probably going to do. Uh, so in two weeks we're going to come back. I'm going to real quick pay the bills, Gary. Uh, ProWrestlingTees.com uh, slash JTRPod for all your jumping the rail t-shirts. And uh, other merchandise, which is you know just T-shirts. We don't have any <laughs> anything else on there right now, but we got plenty of cool designs, I think. And uh, anything you guys want to get helps us keep the lights on and keep the microphones plugged in on this podcast. And uh, keep an eye out tomorrow uh, on the JTR Podcast Network YouTube, uh, the Zero One Shootout Podcast. Myself and uh, our buddy Menders, who's been on the show a few times, talking Zero One. We're going to be talking with their tag team champions, Country Air, Zach Hendricks, and Doc Simmons tomorrow before the big uh, ambition show on Saturday. And then, uh, yeah, and other than that, we're going to, uh, you know, keep uh, putting stuff on the Twitter, on the social media and everything. So, Gary, if do you have anything you want to add before we say goodnight here? No. No, I think I, I'll get all my complaining out. <laughs> For now. For now, yeah. Give For me now. a let me reload. Yeah, we'll reload. I, I can always find something to get you grumpy about. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. So until next time, enjoy full gear on Saturday, or if you're watching GCW, whatever wrestling you're watching, then watch it and enjoy it. And uh, for my buddy Gary, this is Redman reminding you all life is hard, so work stiff. See you later and enjoy the new credits. <laughs> <laughs>